so it's interesting because we just do it in the Conley and we're talking because it, tonight is basically for youth baseball and the way athletics have changed from just my time to his time to your time has certainly right. changed. Um, you have, I think you give lessons to kids as well, yeah, right? right. Yeah. So when you were growing up, there was no form of major <laughs> leaguer to give you lessons um, and all these travel leagues, like his son is seven years old and he's already playing travel ball. Yeah. How do we keep the game open to everyone, like, you know, to keep that advantage, that level playing field where we used to go out on the field and whoever excelled eventually made their high school team and went on and on. Well, we need the guys like Corey's kids, and Corey, these younger guys are still playing now. We need them to stay involved in the game when they get done and not just separate themselves from the game. You know, that's why you see a lot of guys, uh, you know, ex-players that were teaching hitting lessons or pitching lessons, and, and because they're, they're still interested in the kids, and we want them out there on the, on the playgrounds playing. And we, they got to play, or they're not going to get better. They just, you can't play just the, the season and go, okay, that's it. And they got the select leagues, and you know and that, that's good though, because you want to separate sometimes with better kids, because when you got three or four really good kids, and you got about eight kids that are really marginal, you spend all your time with the eight kids, and the three good ones get neglected. So you're better off taking those three and those three and those three, and you make a nice team. And then these other kids get to play more innings, and then all of a sudden one of these kids develop into a better player. And that kid's all of a sudden he's on the select team. So, I mean, it's, it's attrition and everything now, man. I mean, these guys are bigger, stronger, faster. Like, you know, when I played, there was one game on a week. Every game's on TV now. Every game. You know, I mean, there's ten cameras at every game shooting in the dugout, the top of the scoreboard. You know, you know, you can't pick your nose, comb your hair. Poor, poor Leland got to hide the in a crapper to smoke a cigarette because the city of Detroit got on it. But that's interesting that you say that. With, with all the speciality that we've gotten, you know, I'm 52. All right? yeah. I remember your card when you were on the Royals, but didn't, you know. Right. But, but, so you take a look at back in the day, and every guy knew how to bunt. Yeah. Guys don't know how to lay oh. a bunt down anymore. No, no so, clue. And, and basic fundamentals, hitting the cutoff man. Why, even though we have all these travel leagues, have the fundamentals eroded a little bit from the game? Yeah, it's, it's, it falls back in who's coaching them. You know, you got to have guys coaching know what's going, what's going on. I'll tell you another thing that faded out. You go to, you know, go to the ball game early. You know, they're still taking batting practice. Nobody takes infield practice anymore before a game to get warmed up a little bit and get the sweat rolling. And a lot of it, some of these outfielders, I mean, they couldn't throw me out. I mean, there's <laughs> some bad arms in the Major League Baseball. They're great talent. They can run. They can hit. But a lot of those guys can't throw at all, and they don't. I, don't, I think they're embarrassed to show it, and then they just quit doing it. I don't know if the players association says oh, we're not doing infield anymore because you know they're pretty strong, you know, as far as association. But we just we just got to keep bringing the kids in, doing these youth clinics, and maybe we'll touch some of these kids. And that's what these dinners and this night's all about is going out and doing those 85 clinics, and hopefully we'll have a hundred or more next year. And we're in Puerto Rico, we're in the UK. We're all over the United States, and we're gonna. There's gonna be some of those kids one of these days. Hey, I was at that alumni camp in Cooperstown. Here I am in the big leagues. You'll be interviewing one of those kids, you know. And so we try to just kind of keep them interested in the game. There's so much else out there. Oh my God, there's lacrosse and soccer, and football, basketball, golf, swimming, Olympics. You know, I mean, there's just so many, and there's a lot of good athletes out there too. You know. What was the thing that drew you to do? Well, I, you know, I don't know. I, I, just, I grew up on a farm out in Harrisburg, Ohio, in Central Ohio. Uh, my dad left home when I was three, so I didn't have a, really a male influence. So I do a lot of speaking at different uh, high schools and stuff, a lot of inner city where these kids don't know who their father is. And I told him, I said, don't use that as a crutch. Well, I don't have, you know, I'm on one family, uh, one parent family. Hey, so was I. I made it to the big leagues. I got a college degree. You know, I've taught school. I've worked labor. I worked. I've unloaded trucks as a, you know, growing up. So don't tell me hey, you can't do it. Can't's not part of my vocabulary. So you just got to go out there. And I just I started playing. Uh, the local team, local uh, local community started a team. I was like eight or nine years old. Got on the team and just I said this is for me. And people come up to me when I was eight, nine, or ten years old. Hey, what do you want to do when you grow up? You going to run the farm and. We had 150 acres. I said, no. <laughs> I want to be in the big leagues. They're going, no, no, really. We mean for like a real job. Because back then, my grandfather, whose dad came over from Wales on the boat, he, he couldn't process that I could make money playing baseball. See, that was like, well, you guys stay here on the farm and, you know, grow the corn and the wheat and grow the, you know, the pigs and gather the eggs and, you know, 
through those check-ins and all that, that, that he didn't process it. He never did catch that. But uh, do you remember the first game you heard? I mean, obviously, I mean there were no games of the week back there on the farm. What was the first game you heard or first game you saw? Well, I had the old radio, and I lived near Columbus, so we'd pull the Cleveland game in. As, as well as the Reds. The Reds have always had that 50,000 watt station, WLW. So I, could, I, was, so I was a fan of both the Reds and the Indians. But I remember keeping score, man, Harvey Keene and, you know, Wally Post for the Reds and Gus Bell and those guys, you know, middle 50s. You know, when things were, I was born in 46, so like in 54, 55, 56, right through there. Man, I'd keep a scorecard, have my mom go buy me a book. Scorebook, and I keep the uh, I keep what they did, the stats. Because I collect the baseball cards like crazy, but that's how I, I stayed in it. I just loved it. I just, and it was a game was tough for me to play because I could go out and shoot hoops because I didn't need anybody else. I didn't need anybody else. Other guys, right? I got to find eight or nine other kids. At least the catcher. Just to, yeah, just to play a little bit. And I, I wore my mom out. My sister was three years older than me, and she stopped catching me at a young age. She goes, I'm not catching any of those balls you throw because I could throw hard when I was young. And uh, so it just ended up, uh, you know, we finally got enough kids rounded up and, and uh, you know, just went from there, just kept progressing. I stayed with it. God gave me some talent and I, I utilized it. Excellent. Yeah. Thanks so much.